Hi, everyone. Just in a few days as I record this in early April 2022, we're going to be having the Passover. And I thought it would be good. This won't, this won't take long as usual, maybe half hour, 35 minutes or so. But I thought it'd be good to have a few things to think about as we come to Passover, about our role as members of the body of Christ in particular. And uh, anyway, so let's get into it. I, I hope you'll all listen to this, as many of you who see it. Uh, when we, we know we have to first repent, be baptized, and receive God's Spirit before partaking of the body and blood of Christ. Most of you hearing this by now know that we must, before we take Christ's body and blood, or pictured by the unleavened bread and the red wine, we must first examine ourselves, and then we partake of it. Some of you believe that it's to, you can partake of it with a grape juice. Uh, I do believe it's red wine. If you believe it's grape juice, the Bible's definition of what they drank that night uh, was fruit of the vine, or just of the cup. It doesn't it doesn't say wine, I don't think. It just says fruit of the vine. But uh, I take wine. You might take grape juice. That's fine. Uh, be sure in your mind what it is. I'll give a blog sometime why I believe it's red wine. But anyway, my point is not that so much. Uh, but we do have to examine ourselves before we partake of it and not get so bogged down in the doctrine of whether it's wine or red wine, or, or I mean grape juice or red wine. And we don't examine ourselves and then decide not to take it. No, we're, we're, said, we're told to examine ourselves and so let him eat of, of the bread and, and, and drink of the cup and so on. But anyway, this was said, what I'm about to read to you is said, was said by Yeshua, Jesus, uh, just before the Passover. In John 6, if you read John 6, verse 4, it says this was all before the Passover, it drew near, and then what happens in everything in John 6, it was with that in context. John 6, 53, 56 says, Jesus said to them, Surely I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You've got to be involved with Passover. Don't think it's a light thing is what I'm trying to say here. And what he said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise him up in the last day. My flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. So for he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So it's important we take it. If you want to have eternal life, it's important. We must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, pictured by the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And if you're baptized and had hands laid on you for the reception of God's Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit has immersed you, baptized you into the body of Christ. So uh, that's what 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says. Let me start in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For as the body is one, but has many members, but all the members of that are one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Christ has all of us, bunches of us, thousands of us, being members of his body. Some of us are a hand or a foot or skin or something, but we're all part of that one body. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we've all been made to drink of one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Many members, one body. So let me say, holy, precious, righteous brothers and sisters, under the righteousness of God, who are in Christ Jesus, the church, or ecclesia, that is one body. It's not supposed to be many splits or split up branches of the body. In the song, Onward Christian Soldiers, is there not a phrase in there, all one body we, right? All one body we. Is that true? One in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Are we one? I'm not a singer, but are we one? I don't think so. We're all so split up, it's horrible. I'm saying even within the COGS, Church of God groups, there are a lot of splits. Certainly within other church groups, there are lots of splits. As we come to Passover, be praying that God will bring his church together. Christ said his body is not to be divided. 1 Corinthians, 10 to, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13. Paul pleaded with the Corinthians, don't be splitting it up into divisions and party spirits. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13 
I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, that there be no, I plead with you, that there be no splits, no branches of this vine, you know, that, that you justify it that way. No, no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. How is it that each of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, I'm of this uh, split-off group, I'm of that split group? Nonsense, brethren. Is Christ divided? Can we split up the body of Christ and have an arm over there and a leg over there? That's what's happening. Was Paul crucified for you? Why are you saying you're Paul? I wasn't crucified for you, he's saying. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Come on. So if you're one of those who are dividing, or are you even a part of the one body of Christ? I assure you, the total body of Christ is not limited to where you attend or the group you attend with. I assure you there are people where you attend who are part of the body and who are some who are not. And I assure you there are people out there have nothing to do with your group who have God's Spirit. So Jesus said he will bring the sheep who are not of this flock. Look what he said here in John 10, verse 16. Other sheep I have, not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. There will be one flock. Right now, that's not the way it is. So what is the body of Christ? Is it a specific corporate group? Absolutely not. Many of us were raised years ago, 40, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, that only those of us in this group are God's true church. Until you found other people led by God's Spirit who had never even heard of your church. It is anyone who has, a body of Christ is anyone who has and is led by God's Spirit anywhere in the world. Those led by God's Spirit, who have the fruit of God's Spirit, are sons of God, Romans 8, 9, and 14. I'm totally convinced there are Spirit-led children of God scattered in various groups that you won't even recognize. Ask God to open your eyes. The problem is we expect the body of Christ to be composed only of people who believe exactly like we do on every single doctrinal point. I really believe too many of us have overemphasized doctrine. We really have. And knowledge, just like the Gnostics of old, they focused on knowledge, gnosis, Gnostics. But, they, but, don't, but, but, but people like that often underemphasize profoundly the profoundly close love relationship we should have with Yeshua and God the Father. I'm going to talk about a few examples of doctrine to make my point. Doctrine is important. Christ said that God the Father likes to be worshipped in spirit and truth, so it, that is important. I'm not minimizing it. But it's not the only thing. So the truth is great, but make sure you're worshipping him in spirit as well and in love. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 to 8. Uh, before I go there, I want to talk about Apollos first. Apollos was also an apostle at some point. And he started preaching. Aquila and Priscilla heard him and realized that he wasn't fully aware of the way of the Lord. So they didn't reject him. They gently brought him aside and brought him up to speed, if you will, about Paul, uh, Apollos. You need to know some of these other things. Paul actually liked Apollos. Paul had started the Corinthian church. Apollos came in behind him. Paul didn't, uh, Paul didn't uh, re you know, resent that. Paul said he planted the seed and Apollos watered. Let's read it, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 to 8. Paul says, who then is Paul? Who am I? And who's Apollos? We're just servants. We're just ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. Sure, he said, I planted. Apollos watered. If you're planting seed, you've got to have someone watering it. You've got to have someone weeding around and taking care of it. So I planted. Apollos watered. God gave the increase. I'm in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 7 now. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. 
It's all to the glory of God. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Apollos and I are one. Peter and I are one. Don't try to be dividing us up between ourselves because that won't happen. So he says, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. By the way, as you hear this, remember to always check the video sermons and the audio sermons because sometimes I do video, sometimes I do audios. The audios are a lot easier to produce, take a lot less work. And then also the blogs. Be sure to be checking the blogs. And we're going to be doing a lot more with the blogs, which are articles. Short three, four, five page articles. Anyway, they worked together. Even though the brethren started talking about being of Paul, of Apollos. Paul was very complimentary and friendly to Apollos. Paul says he was not a good speaker. First Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2.1 He was not a good speaker. Uh, if he spoke like he wrote, imagine you'd be wondering, what's he saying now? But Apollos was eloquent. He kept you lively and involved. He probably had funny stories to liven up the sermon. So it's understandable that some would prefer to listen to Apollos. Ministers, please, let's be more like Paul. Bring people together. Bring ministers together. Start by being one with some other God, of God's ministers. And start inviting people from other groups to attend with yours for a Sabbath. And your group goes attend with theirs for another Sabbath. Christ is not divided. 1 Corinthians 1.13 It's ridiculous. So some believe, they hear some examples of, of how, how else uh, doctrine comes into play. Some believe the resurrection of the dead was already passed. In the church I used to attend with, with the Church of God group, uh, Paul, uh, anyway, those people would have been thrown out of the church. They would have been disfellowshipped. Paul didn't do any such thing. Paul didn't order them thrown out of the church. No, he explained about, the, about resurrections and all of that. But nowadays, if someone has a slightly different belief, well, he's not being submissive, he's causing division, we got to get rid of him. There is a point where someone has to be put out of the church, like in 1 Corinthians 5, but that's a rarity, not, not the rule. In other cases, Paul says, look, sometimes doctrinal differences don't amount to a hill of beans. If it's not salvational, move on. There's not a dime's worth of difference between you guys and you can't get together. It's okay if some won't eat meat, for example, Paul says, or don't want to drink wine. That's okay. So if that someone really feels it's wrong to drink wine, let them drink grape juice, the fruit of the vine. Romans 14, 14 to 21, you can read that whole passage there. Some were very strict vegetarians who thought that any meat was unclean and wrong. Paul said, hey, to not be offensive, I won't even eat meat at all when I'm around people like that or drink wine if I'm around them, and they're going to be offended by it. He said, when we're offensive to brethren and, and when we know better, and we still do something we know is going to be bothersome to them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8 that we sin against Christ. Why? Because we're not regarding or esteeming the Lord's body. Now that might actually be in Romans 14 where he says we sin against Christ. It's either in 1 Corinthians 8 or Romans 14. We're not regarding or esteeming the Lord's body, which is the church, when we just, you know, just callously do what we know is offending people. Just because we know that scripturally, we're right. It's okay to eat meat. It's okay to drink small amounts of wine. It's not okay to get drunk or to be a glutton. Some of God's people like to spend an hour before teaching starts and singing and dancing and praising God in music and dance. Some of you reject that. Don't reject God's people who like to be like David, who danced as he worshipped and praised. Danced. And many of David's psalms, especially read Psalms 145 to 150, for example, he talks about praising him in the harp and the cymbals, trumpets and the dance and the clapping of the hands and raising of the hands in praise. Imagine if where you attend, if you brought a, some cymbals during the song service or tambourine. Some churches wouldn't allow that. Scripture says that's what David loved to do. Those of you who like all that dancing and singing, don't you, on the other hand, reject those who want to sit back and wait until all that's done and then they'll listen to the service? And they'd rather be quiet, conservative, rather be private. Come on, come together. 
You can let those who want to dance, dance, and let those who don't want to dance, let them sit. If people want to call God Abba, or Elohim, or Yehovah, or Yahweh, and they want to call Jesus Yeshua, or Yahshua, or Yehoshua, let each one worship God and pray and speak of their God in the way that they believe makes a lot of sense. It gives them a good conscience. The pronunciation of these things I don't believe is salvational. God would have made it extremely clear to all of us. Some of you believe it is extremely clear. I like to say Yehovah. And the evidence in my mind points that direction. But if someone says Yahweh, I'll, I might even in discussing things with them even start saying Yahweh in front of them as well. I don't want to cause offense. I'd rather be one. Church of the living God. Church of God people. By that I mean you who have God's Holy Spirit. Those of you who want to obey God. I don't mean any corporate group when I say this, Church of God. I, I'm saying all of us, whether you're part of a little group up in the panhandle of Florida, wherever you are, are you hearing me? Are you hearing God's words on this? We're supposed to be one body, picturing Christ's one body, one flock. Are you hearing it? I've said before, and I'll say again, I can't imagine Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, marrying a bride who's made up mostly of people claiming to be the first fruits of the bride of Christ, but want nothing to do with those groups over there. He's not going to marry a bride made up of people who claim to be the bride, but who won't have anything to do with one another from other groups. It makes no sense. It's not going to happen. So if you want to be the bride of Christ, start becoming one body that he can marry. So bride people, let's be one bride. I've got to say that. I feel very strongly in my spirit to say it. I don't know how many of you will hear it or follow it. I hope you do. Tell others about this message. Paul said he wanted to present the church as one virgin, not five, not ten, not fifty, not a hundred. Second Corinthians 11.2 says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The bride is one virgin. However you understand other verses, the bride is one body pictured by Christ. Just as Eve came out of the body of Adam and was really part of his body, we also have come out of Christ and are in Christ. My point is, as we come to Passover, let's endeavor in the coming months and years to be someone who brings people together. Christ said we're either gathering or scattering his people. Luke eleven twenty three. You're either gathering with me, he says, or you're scattering my people. So whatever's keeping you from gathering with other people, resolve hurt feelings, bring people back together, be one. But we have preconceived ideas of what a true believer is supposed to be like. So we refuse fellowship with other spirit-led sons of God. We look down on others. We put people and God into neat little boxes. I believe these attitudes are a big reason for something else, a big reason for us not seeing a lot of dramatic healings. There are some, I've been involved in some, I've had some myself in my own body, but we're not seeing a lot out there. We start praying for someone, uh, someone's surgery go well, and, and this and that. Where's the healing? There's a reason we're not seeing the healings. You shall lay hands upon the sick, and the sick shall be made well. You shall not be hurt by deadly things. Right? All the things that were promised. So we're not esteeming the body of Christ. I think that the body of Christ in context I'm about to read can refer to the actual body of Christ's body himself. But I think in context more likely refers to the church. It's starting in chapter 1, chapter 3, and others where he's talking about the relationship people have with each other, not suing each other and going to court against each other, and all these things. First Corinthians eleven twenty six to 32 
1 Corinthians 11, 26 to 32. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So let each man examine himself, and, let him, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You don't examine yourself and then decide not to take it. No, you examine yourself and say, boy, do I ever need this Passover. Thank God that we have Jesus Christ, who will take us into the promised land, but he also will bring us back to the relationship with God. You know, I'll talk about the two Joshuas sometime. The Joshua, Joshua 5, who uh, came under the command of the son of uh, the angel of the Lord, who was Jesus Christ, and who led them into the promised land. And then the other Joshua of Zechariah 3, a, a high priest, um, who helped bring them back from Babylon to the promised land. And he was in filthy garments, but uh, he had all his iniquity taken away, removed. So anyway, verse. so let him examine himself and so let him eat. Okay, don't, don't examine and decide not to eat. Remember what I said at the beginning. If you don't take the Passover, you have no life in you. Take the Passover. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, those are people who haven't examined themselves, haven't confessed their sins, haven't thanked Jesus Christ for what he did for us, and God our Father for allowing all that to go through and, and the pain he must have gone through. So the unworthy manner are those who haven't prepared yet. So make sure you're prepared. Okay. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So I hope we can start resolving this issue of not wanting anything to do with the believers over there, or meeting with them, or them meeting with us, so God can start healing more powerfully within the body. I have a sermon about Passover and its connection to healing. Just type in Passover healing, and I believe it will come up in the search bar. I recommend you hear it if you're interested in more about that. I give lots of examples, Old and New Testaments, where that definitely was the case. Now as we come together in everything we do, let's point people to Yeshua. It's to His glory, to Father's glory, to Yeshua's glory. Everything we do is to their glory. Here's what I know about this Passover. It's all about Yeshua. What a precious and beautiful name we have in Jesus, Yeshua. It means Savior, one who saves. We have a Savior. We were destined to die. We were drowning. We were sentenced to death. Who saved you on Passover day from certain death because of you and my sins? Our Savior did that on Passover day. You were pronounced guilty by God the Father, and so was I. But you accepted Christ in your repentance, and so all of your sins were placed on sinless Jesus, and he was pronounced guilty. So you could now be seen without guilt, because all his sins were put on you. I mean, all your sins, I'm sorry, all your sins were put on him, and all his righteousness was given to us. So he who knew no sin became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ or in Christ. There is a big swap. You give me all your sins and I'll give you all my righteousness. Many of you reject those verses to your hurt. There's so many. Anyway, he continues to and he also, so we were pronounced guilty at first, but all that was given to Christ. So he was the one now pronounced guilty, and we were seen without sin. And Christ and God continue to purge us of sin. First John 1 John 1.7 as we go along. So all of God's wrath we had earned was placed on Jesus, on Yeshua. God is no longer angry with you or me. He sees us covered by the life of his precious son. So focus on that relationship with him. Perhaps even more that uh, than you focus on having right doctrine and knowledge of the truth. It's both. You need right doctrine as best as you can. But you need to really regard the body of Christ, focus on Jesus himself. God is to be worshipped in spirit and truth, yes. But we are to abide in him, in Christ. And whoever abides in the vine has eternal life. I read that earlier 
that uh, if you eat my flesh, John 6, verse 56, and drink my blood, abides in me. He who does that abides in me and I in him. So we need the Passover. Be ready. Make sure you've examined yourself. Just don't walk in just the last minute after being so busy the days before. And by the way, even as you deleaven, even as you deleaven, focus more on the spiritual deleaven. Okay, yes, gather up the obvious leaven and, and pull out the couch and vacuum the house and clean up the car and all that. We do all that too. But some of you spend weeks doing this. God gave them actually one day if you look at Exodus 12. So go ahead and get the leaven out and then spend the most of your time taking out the leaven of hypocrisy and wickedness and false doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees and all that. And don't just walk in at the last minute to the Passover service. Have your deep self-examination going on now before God in repentance, a lot of joy, forgiveness. You read Psalm 51, you'll see that David, he has this awesome, terrible regret and uh, sadness over his sin. And by the time you get over the sin with Uriah, the, having killed Uriah and, and the adultery with Bathsheba, the murder of Uriah was the more serious in God's eyes because that was intentional. And then the last part of Psalm 51, you, you hear, you read of his joy, that I may bring sinners to you and all of this. David, all within that one prayer, goes from deep agony to sheer joy. And that's the way we should feel coming to Passover. We seek to know Yeshua, Jesus, much deeper than ever before, to know God the Father as never before. Even defining what is God's work. Look how Jesus put God's work, the work of God. We all think it's getting radio and TV and magazines all over the world. This is what Yeshua said, John 6, 28 and 29. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. The work of God is leading yourself and others to believe in Jesus Christ. And again in John 5, verses 38 to 40, Here's what Jesus said to Jews who were attacking him. He said again, it's much more than just being about doctrine. John 5, 38. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures. You're in your Bible a lot. For in them you think you have eternal life. But these just talk about me. These testify about me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Have you come to Jesus? Do you speak to Jesus? Do you talk to him? Do you thank him for what he did, as well as thanking God the Father for allowing that to happen? Come to Jesus. Talk and pray to him. Yes, I pray mostly to God the Father. When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven and all that. But I also pray to Jesus Christ, as John did. Revelation 22.20 20 is a good example. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. As Stephen did in Acts 7, 59.60. So, uh, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. He's talking to Jesus there. That's in Acts 7, verses 59 and 60. It's okay to pray to Jesus. Some of you believe it's got to always just pray to God the Father. Well, let me tell you this. If you think you're going to marry Jesus, Yeshua, all of you who are married, did you spend all your talking and visiting time with the father of the bride? Or the father of the groom, I mean? whoever, Whichever way it was. The father, the one you're going to marry? Or did you want to spend the time with the bride? Did you want to spend the time with the bridegroom? So absolutely talk to the father of the bridegroom. But please talk to the bridegroom as well. So be ready on past. It's ridiculous, right? If you just look at it that way, that you're just not going to talk to the bridegroom, just the father of the bridegroom. So be ready on Passover to come into his presence with joy. Psalm 16, 11 says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So come to Passover, knowing you're accepted, knowing you've examined yourself, and realize we fall short, but in Christ we are a new creation. Second Corinthians 5.17 and Second Corinthians 5.21 says, We now have the righteousness of God over us through Christ. So we will partake of his perfectly unleavened, sinless, 
perfect body and life as we focus on him. He's the meaning of the unleavened bread we eat during Passover week. Remember Ezekiel 45, 21 talks about Passover, a feast of seven days. So the Bible itself even calls that whole period Passover week. Don't, don't think I'm stupid here. Okay, the, 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 the whole meaning of unleavened bread we eat is about him. And so when we take of that Passover unleavened bread and then the days of unleavened bread, we eat unleavened bread. We're reminding ourselves to let Christ be our new life. It's all about him. He's unleavened. There's no leavening to have to take out of his life. And in him, we already got rid of the leaven in our life, pictured by us throwing out the leaven just before, uh, just before the days of unleavened bread begin. And like Paul, I glory and I boast in the cross of my Lord. Galatians 6.14, I have a sermon on it, a couple sermons on it, and what he accomplished on that cruel instrument of death. But for us, it's a symbol of God's forgiveness for us. So as we come to Passover, by the way, if you're struggling with God giving us his righteousness, and hear my teachings called God's perfection for us, God's way. You know, hear those two teachings. God's perfection for us, God's way. And hear the teachings on grace and, and God's favor. So as we come to Passover, I understand I'm a broken vessel. I was. God accepted, healed my brokenness because of Yeshua. We've all been awful sinners. Some, some of us have had awful sins. I have. Maybe you have. But at Passover, we understand there's no sin greater than God's grace. God's love and his grace is far greater than any sins. Far greater than any of your sins. His gracious favor came through Christ like a wave upon wave upon wave at the beach coming to you. John 1, 17. Grace upon grace. Hallelujah. We come to Passover forgiving anyone that we've offended or we know we, we've offended or they've offended us. Even the worst of sinners, we would lovingly welcome to Christ's body if that person renounced his past and accepted Jesus as his Savior. By the way, be looking for the sermon I'm going to be giving about since the only time of salvation because what about all those people who the 4,000 years or so before Yeshua even walked the earth never even heard the name Yeshua? And in his, it, only in his name is there salvation. In no other name. Acts 4 verse 12 or something like that. So hear, hear that because God is very just. And God is very fair. And so look at the one Jesus selected to write most of the New Testament. He forgave him, certainly. Paul, a terrible zealot who had tortured and killed many of the Jerusalem brethren. The beginning of Acts 9, where it talks about the encounter on the road to Damascus. He had killed and imprisoned and tortured so many brethren in Jerusalem, there weren't very many left, and so he wanted to go all the way to Damascus to find some more. And read Acts 9, verse 1. He was breathing threats and murder. So look at the Lord's confrontation with him on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, verses 1 to 9. And Saul was blinded by the brilliance and, and by God doing that. There was a believer in Damascus named Ananias who knew perfectly well about Paul and heard about his cruelty. And then Yeshua told him, no, I want you to go welcome Paul. Tell him he's got a job and, and got to go. And Ananias said, Lord, have you not heard about this guy? <laughs> I love that. And so he explains, yes, I have. I know all about him, and he's going to be different. So go welcome him into the body. This is somebody who's killed fellow believers, hurt fellow believers. The first words out of Ananias' mouth, Acts 9, verse 17. Brother Saul, the first thing it is, touch him. Brother Saul. Brother some of us don't want to call someone a brother or a sister if they don't attend our congregation or our particular church group. Come on, brethren. One body we. All one body we. Our God Most High, who happens to be our own Abba, our Father, didn't want to spend eternity, by the way, without you. Think about that as you come to Passover. So he made the way possible no matter how bad your sins were or even sometimes you fall still into he made the way possible through his only son, Jesus. God's Passover lamb, glory to him, who takes away the sins of the world. So now you're a child of God, and he, God, is our father. All of this was possible 
Because on Passover day, short of 2,000 years ago, on Passover day, the one we're going to glorify at Passover took all of your guilt and all of the wrath God had on you. It was all placed on him. He was beaten mercilessly, crucified, killed in a terrible death so that you wouldn't have to die or suffer. We're going to honor him on Passover. We're going to honor Father. Let us pray. Father, we bow down our heads. We worship you. Oh, do we worship you. Jesus, Yeshua, and we worship you. We bow way down, even as we raise holy hands to worship you, to reach out to you. Come be in us, Father. Come be in us, Jesus Christ, by your Spirit. Father, Yeshua, we love you. Come in us by the Spirit of the Holy God. Help us love you more. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts to feel you, to see you, to hear you. Open us to obey you, to love you, to prove our love by obedience, to submit to you, to seek you, to grow in your image as you are in the image of Abba above. And when we do stumble, to know that you are there for us, that you will come and help us. You will never leave us or forsake us. Open us to you, dear Lord. Have your way with us. Have your way in us. Oh God, help us cooperate as you bring all your sheep into one flock. Rebuke Satan's work of dividing your people and letting us be content with that. Let us not be content with that anymore. Open our eyes and hearts to understand we must come together. You hate divisions. Christ, you're not divided, neither should we be. Your people be divided. Help us be one in you and Father as you are one. Master, change us to look and act and live to be just like you. Live in us as you lived when you walked the earth, that very earth you created. How we failed to measure up so many times, but time is short because you're going to be returning soon. May we become less and may you become greater in our lives. As people see us, may they see more of you, Yeshua. As John said, you must increase, Lord, and we must decrease. You've saved us, so now help us do good works and to share what we have with others. Help us bring more people to you and disciple others. Help us come together with other spirit-led believers. Help us be zealous on this earth, no longer lukewarm Laodiceans. Help us wake up out of our sleep. All ten virgins slept. Help us wake up out of our sleep. And do the work while it's day, while it's still possible. Help us harvest your fields of wheat, for the harvest is plenteous. Jesus, Yeshua, our Passover, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you suffered through for us on Passover day, almost 2,000 years ago. And Father, thank you for what you suffered also as father watching his sinless son his beloved son having to go through all that for us because you love us as much as you loved him Jesus be our passion live in us please live in us lion of Judah please live in us prince of peace our coming husband Help us see you and hear you, Master. Help us accept and to put on the robe of righteousness. You grant us your robe of righteousness. Let us not be found naked or with filthy garments of self-righteousness and sin. Pour our salve, and our salve into our eyes that we may see. Please turn us into red-hot, zealous members of your holy one body. Give us a most meaningful Passover this year. Shua and Father, Again, to you be all the glory, and thank you. In Jesus' holy, mighty, loving name, amen.